and we're going to be talking about distributed HPC applications with unprivileged containers. Thank you, Stefan. So I'm Felix. This is Jonathan. We work at NVIDIA and, uh, in California, and we're going to talk about our infrastructure, how we use containers for multiple different applications. So let me get something out of the way. I know we just got Steam, but, but, and we are from NVIDIA, but we don't do video games. Uh, and so people, sometime when I go to a conference about Linux and containers, they say, why are you here? You're NVIDIA, you're, you, you do Windows and games. But, but that's not only what we do, actually. So our latest GPUs do ray tracing with RTX, so that's useful for games, but also for visualization, professional visualization, for movies. Um, and in the middle, we have, we have a type of GPUs that's only used for crunching numbers, so like astrophysics, biology, simulation, mathematics, machine learning. Um, so uh, we have GPUs that don't have a display. They don't have a display. You put them in the data center, and they, they just crunch numbers like deep learning or, or um, what we call HPC, high performance computing. And on the other end of the spectrum, we even have autonomous uh, machines like robots, self-driving cars, so it's like more like smaller system, embedded systems that people can use for computer visions and, and kind of real-time real -time tasks uh, that are involved. So we call that GPU computing, and you might have heard of CUDA. Um, that's our platform for doing that beyond video games. Okay. Um, so we, we, at NVIDIA, we have an infrastructure of, we have multiple clusters, multiple data centers uh, in Santa Clara. And we have one that's per, per some benchmark, the top 500, that's a measure of supercomputers. We are number 20 in the world. And those are very, very large machines right here. We have 16 GPU, each more than 400 watts. Uh, so with a total of 12 kilowatts per machine, and we have 96 of those, 1.5 terabyte of RAM. So that, those are machines that are gigantic. Infinity band for the networking because we need very fast networking. Um, and pretty uncommon we were in Ubuntu, uh, a little bit uncommon in HPC, but, but, but it, uh, that happens. So the next talk is about, I know the next talk is about Raspberry Pi, and that's a, that could be a lot of Raspberry Pis to reach one node here, 12 kilowatt. Um, four years ago, we, uh, Jonathan and myself, we started a project called NVIDIA Docker, and then evolved into LibNVIDIA Container, and the goal was to make it easy to deploy your CUDA applications in containers. And so it, it worked pretty well. It's, and now it supports all runtime, so that's good because it doesn't force us to use a specific runtime. We can use LXC, we can use RenC, Docker, ContainerD, uh, Kubernetes. You can run your CUDA apps uh, in there. And especially we use containers at NVIDIA for deep learning and HPC because we know some of these apps are difficult to package, to install, and, and they sometimes conflict between each other. So we put that in a container and we put that on Docker Hub or, uh, or some of them in our own container registry. People can download those and have a stack already installed for TensorFlow, PyTorch, um, biology, and stuff like that. And so we use containers for a lot of things, even benchmarking, and especially for machine learning, deep learning. So uh, I've mentioned our hardware, so, but let's take a look at what a typical cloud deployment looks like. So, so you don't have nodes usually like we have, 12 kilowatts. You have maybe smaller nodes, instances on AWS, hundreds of thousands of them. And you can generalize for security, we, uh, not for sometimes for packaging, but also for security. And you have microservices, so maybe 100 containers per node. You have traffic from the outside world. You have uh, user uploads and stuff like that, uh, internal traffic. And you don't use that. Users don't, uh, don't access the cluster directly. They, they basically ask someone if they can deploy a new app on the cluster. And you have advanced features like that I've listed here. But um, So that was kind of the Kubernetes, what Kubernetes has to offer. So, going to what we do at NVIDIA, as you've seen, very large nodes, and we kind of trust the users because our cluster are sometimes air-gapped or very little access to the outside. So if someone acts the cluster, if someone uses zero day on our cluster, I mean, we're just going to fire him, and that's, that's pretty much it. We, we, they, they run trusted, we run trusted, trusted code on our, on, our, on our clusters. So, and also not all applications are containerized. If an application is not containerized because it's packaged well, well, don't use a container. We don't want people to force users to use a container. 
because they did that job correctly. So um, the, this actual step is actually eliminate Kubernetes already because Kubernetes is, is fully containerized everything. And we have few applications per node. We, don't, we are not very dense. And we have multi-node jobs also, which means that you, have, you need to start 30, um, you need to start the job on 30 nodes in parallel. So it, take, it takes a bit of time. And as I say, mostly little traffic to the outside world. So, uh, so we, we are not choosing Kubernetes, like, unlike maybe many people before us. We have chosen something that's pretty classic in HPC called Slurm. So it's more, it was way more adapted to our use case. So it has advanced scheduling algorithms, so for codas, teams, and stuff like that. And especially it supports gang scheduling, which means that if you need to run on 30 nodes, there is no need to start running unless everyone is ready. Because if you start running on 50 nodes, you're just going to spend CPU cycles waiting for the other 15 nodes to join. So you really have to make sure that they are all ready at the same time and start at pretty much the same time, otherwise it's just waste. Uh, low runtime overhead, the control plane is pretty small. Uh, topology aware so that, that if you have new machines, you, are, you optimize for performance in the allocation. And it, it's user centric is that you, you submit a bash script, it will run your bash script. You can SSH into a login node and then have an interactive session on a, on a, on a big machine like we showed. And it supports GPUs and, well, the only drawback was it did not support containers. And we use containers for, especially for deep learning, machine learning. So, but it does support plugins. So what we did is uh, we, we looked at our requirements and we need performance, we need no overhead in uh, the container runtime. We need to support Docker images because our researchers still install Docker on their machines because that's, that's convenient, that's a nice UI, Docker build, everything is, is, is nice. We need soft cluster multi-tenancy, so that means that you can have multiple users on the same machine, but you just, just want to make sure they don't steal resources from someone else. We are not trying to really strongly isolate uh, between, uh, so it's not a security boundary, just you, you, you have two CPUs, you have four CPUs, and you cannot take more. And we need GPU support, Mellanox for uh, RDMA for networking, and multi-node jobs, so the runtime should not get in the way of all of that. And also interactive containers. You can install package, uh, P-Trace, S-Trace, GDB, your process, uh, everything like that. So there was no container runtime that really filled this need, so it was actually simpler. It was simpler still to use Slurm, but use their plugin system to create a new one and integrate it, than modifying Kubernetes for our needs. So that's what we did. Uh, before I hand over to Jonathan, just want to mention that, so get, get something out of the way first, is that to, uh, writing a secure privileged container runtime is very, very hard. So there's this presentation by Alexa uh, from, from a f um, one month ago or so. So um, we, we, you really want to have something that, uh, you really have to use what we call user namespaces. And uh, that's basically the point of his, of his talk. So uh, you avoid a lot of issues. And so if you get that out of the way, writing a container runtime is not actually that difficult. Uh, we're not going to explain how to write a container runtime because there's a lot of talks about this already, but we're going to explain more the reasons why we did what we did. And, and the last point being here that even if you, don't tr if you trust your users pretty much like you do, there's still a lot of accidents or damage that can happen if you still give root in, real root inside containers for users like files, access to files or breaking the system or, or being able to debug from outside the container to debug the container. Because if it's, just, um, if it's run as UID zero, you might not be able to debug it. So our runtime is called Android, and I will end off to Jonathan to explain each topic here on this list. Right, so we're gonna go through some of the design principles uh, that are listed here. Uh, and to be fair, it's heavily influenced for LXC. Uh, so, the first thing we did was like, we actually use user namespaces. The reason for that is we wanted a fully unprivileged container. Um, the difference with other runtimes though is we only have one user namespace mapping, which basically uh, maps the user uh, that's outside of the container is the same user uh, inside, so they have the same UID. Uh, and optionally, we let them also remap themselves as root inside the container. And uh, why we have both of, of like both choices is because like some application refuse to run as root, 
and some uh, need actually root access or fake root access. Uh, we also like keep the same username uh, inside the container for just convenience, uh, as not to confuse people, and um, and we can automatically mount home and other things inside the container. Um, also, like note that like run C or like Docker based containers, they they always remap root inside the container, and and we we don't. Uh, so. We talked about other run times and like traditional run times they usually use uh, sub UID and sub JID maps for user namespaces um, and they, they, they do that because they want to allocate a huge chunk of UIDs and GIDs and we don't really do that because we run application containers we don't need like this UID separation but we you kind of have to um, when you start installing packages because uh, you usually need to be root, and you have you need to have additional UIDs and GIDs because uh, the packages will try to install new users and new groups. Um, plus, like there's also a problem with sub UID and sub GID maps is that you have uh, it's difficult to maintain across a cluster. They have some uh, efforts in shadow utils and stuff to solve this problem, but uh, right now it's kind of difficult. And uh, you you can also run into permission issue once you uh, like exit the container then you have like you have to deal with like permissions that were inside the container are now different outside so to solve that we basically use a seccom filter and we trap all the set uid syscalls to make them succeed even though they don't have a, a mapping inside the container uh, we also wanted like a standalone runtime uh, with low overhead so basically there's no daemon involved there's no persistent spawning daemon uh, and we inherit all the C groups from uh, whatever was above us. So it could be systemd, it could be uh, Docker if we're running and root inside Docker, or it could be Slurm itself uh, in our case. Um, and doc uh, for Docker, people are really confused by that because uh, you actually use the C groups from the Docker daemon and not from the Docker run command. Uh, and that's, that's kind of the behavior we wanted. Uh, also, like basically, after the runtime has executed the application, it's out of the picture, so it execs the application and just disappear. So you don't have any other process hanging around like like Run C or Docker have, like to handle PTY or or, exit, or tracking containers. So we don't have that. Uh, we also wanted minimal isolation, so we don't need like this fancy network namespace uh, with like overlays or or we don't need uh, an IP for each container, we don't need to bind privilege port. Uh, we also don't want a PID namespace because it tends to confuse some programs as we saw before. And, um, and also like handling PID1 is pretty tricky. And we've seen a lot of people like running sleep as PID1. Um, uh, as I said, like we, we just uh, want to keep the C groups that were handled to, to us and um, Especially that like the scaler is is like has better insights on like what needs to happen like if you can overcommit resources or not, um, and and obviously it simplifies the runtime and and improves the performance. And speaking on performance, some of like the problems you can get with traditional runtimes is you have a network namespace which like usually involves a bridge or a NAT or overlay uh, networking, so you had overhead there. You have SecComp and LSM, which can have overhead for Cisco heavy uh, applications. We also uh, rely on shared memory a lot, so uh, we need shared IPC namespace. And uh, Docker and other runtimes also try to tune your R limits, which uh, sometimes are not really uh, adapted. Uh, so for example, memlock is pretty low on Docker by default. And uh, something that's less known is like when you actually turn on SecComp by default on a lot of distribution, you turn on also a specter mitigation. So if you're uh, concerned about performance, then like you, we, we actually don't want that. A uh, little note about um, uh, MPI, which is like a standard for framework for message pass passing that we use uh, to communicate uh, inside a node or even outside. Uh, so, MPI doesn't really like also PID and IPC namespaces, as we discussed. And the cool thing of, of having like a fully unprivileged runtime is that we can use a cross memory attach. So it, it's like the Cisco is process VM write V, which is extensively used by uh, MPI. 
And uh, that actually requires P trace access. So uh, with traditional uh, privilege runtimes, it's kind of hard to have that working. Uh, as for coordination with PMI and PMX, I don't really dwell on that, but uh, we just let, like we actually need to pass um, file descriptor to the actual container, so we leak uh, file descriptor inside uh, the containers by default. Uh, the most difficult part is actually the importing Docker images in the runtime, because you have to deal with a lot of, uh, of the OCI stuff, uh, AUFS formats and, uh, and other things, and we really wanted to speed that up uh, because we pull like really big images. Uh, so we, what we do is we actually relay on overlayFS uh, to basically do a, a par in, uh, basically we just want the kernel to do all the uh, squashing of layers rather than like a sequential extraction like Docker or Emoji do. Um, also we found out that like just using plain bash like the parallel curl uh, pipeline it tends to be much faster than the Golang because some of the packages uh, are not really optimized. Um, and we weren't uh, really fond of the format, like the VFS format, for example, that Podman or Docker have because it's huge on disk space. And uh, if you were to use the overlay driver in Docker or other things, what they do is they actually keep the layers uncompressed. Uh, but you can't share the layers between users because you would need something like shiftfs or something uh, to convert the UIDs. Uh So what we do is we actually uh, store, share layers across the same uh, across users in the same group, and we compress them with uh, Z standard. Um, and we have uh, helper binaries for overlay because uh, unfortunately overlay is privilege. Um, it's unprivileged on Ubuntu, but it's kind of broken it right now. So. Uh, we, we have that, uh, which is not owned by default, so only the admin can import images by default with Android. Uh, for the image format, we chose uh, SquashFS, and we wanted it to be super simple. So basically, uh, when we convert the Docker image, all the, the entry point becomes just slash etc slash rc. All the environment goes to etc environment, and the volumes uh, goes to uh, etc fs tab. And basically, when you land in the container, you can edit these configuration, configuration files like you used to and, and restart the container, and it will just be picked up. Uh, we like SquashFS images because you can store that as a single file on the parallel file system and, and use it, pull, pull that really fast internally, and also avoid like all the thundering hertz problems that you have when, multi, well, you kick in uh, a multi node jobs and it starts pulling the image like 100 times. Uh, also useful for hair gapped, where the admin can control actually what you can run, so it imports the SquashFS and just stores it on the cluster. And uh, you can also mount it as a block device and uh, have it lazily fetch, uh, for example, through NFS or something. Uh, also, we, and finally, like, we want it to be super simple. So the runtime is actually just a simple shell script that's like 500 lines of code. And it uses just basic Linux utilities to set up everything. So um, it's actually easy for users and admin to customize everything if they want to. If there's something that they don't like in the runtime, they can change something. And uh, we have users and, and system-wide configuration that you can drop in if you want the mounts or environment in all your containers on the system or, on this, or all the containers are for specific users. You can just write these uh, uh, configuration files. So now for the basic usage, you can just, uh, so basically you can do Android import, it will just uh, give, it, give it the Docker uh, URI and you end up with like uh, SquashFS representing the, the entire image. Then you can store that and share it with someone. Uh, you can create then a container from this SquashFS image, which just unpacks the SquashFS and, uh, under your XDG data path. Uh, and then you can start obviously stuff in there. So, uh, you can run NVIDIA SMI in TensorFlow, or you can also remap yourself as root and have the read-write root file system, so you can install packages as an unprivileged user. Uh, some of the advanced stuff you can do also is you can start the actual image directly. In this case, we actually rely on Fuse to mount SquashFS, and, uh, and all you change are in memory. And the really uh, thing, like, neat thing that like, people like is actually being able to create uh, self-extracting bundles. 
So you can do Android bundle and then you will actually have a, a, a run file, that what we call a run file that includes the image and the runtime. So you can send that to anyone uh, running uh, Linux and they can just run your container without any dependency. So uh, if you have an experience you want to share with a coworker, you can send it by email, send Ubuntu by email or something, uh, which is really, really practical. Uh, especially when you do cloud deployments as well. Um, you don't have to install anything on the instance, you just drop this file and run it. Now, um, when you look at how it's implemented inside, uh, we have few utilities that replace basically the Linux ones. They're really simple. Uh, it's basically three of them, Enroot and Share, Enroot Mount, and Enroot Switch Root. And we have two other ones which are mostly used for Docker imports. If you were to use the actual um, utilities directly, you could write your own custom runtimes really easily. So here you just download the uh, Ubuntu official root file system, you create new namespaces, and then you mount a bunch of things and at the end you just exec uh, switch root and run bash inside your container. And now you have a really simple uh, like container runtime. And now I'll give the talk to Alex, which will explain the Storm plugin that we did. Right, so we saw Enroot, the runtime. So we actually give access to this runtime for our users so they can use Enroot Start, Enroot Create, but we didn't want to have users learn something new because they are used to Docker, and, and, but for, some, for reasons that we have explained, we didn't give them access to Docker um, on, uh, on our cluster. So um, they are used to the syntax above, with Slurm, the command is called srun. You just specify a command and it will run that on one node or multiple nodes. And you say, I want to run Python on one node. And uh, Slurm has a lot of plugins. And it was very nice because we could add, we added the container image, dash dash container image uh, flag. And you say, I want to run TensorFlow. And that's the only change in blue and yellow here. That's the only change that our users had to learn. They can still use Enroot if they want, but we wanted to make it easy. They don't know about the container runtime. They don't know it's Enroot. They don't know. It, it actually started as a prototype with LXC too. And it was the same syntax because here we, we don't need to be very complicated because our runtime is very simple too. We just want to say, run this image with mounts, and that's pretty much it, that's the basic. Um, so a little bit of the details, how we do that in Slurm, that we start the container, so, so right now it's with Enroot, and we basically get the handles on the, the namespaces, we get the environment variables about, about the process, and we get the directory the, where the container is, but we cannot hijack the exec, we cannot hijack the exec Python train.py, so it's more like um, a Docker exec, what we do here, in Slurm, it's we Docker exec was that bef just before we go to the Python train.py, train we do a bunch of set and calls to join the namespaces of the container we have created. And then we end it back to Slurm, and Slurm will execute Python read.py. It doesn't know it's, it that has been containerized in between, but it actually just works. Um, that works just fine with just those few steps. Um, so, quickly, uh, as I said, we have a few, just a few um, new flags. So you can name a container. If you do container image PyTorch, it pulls that from Docker Hub transparently. And you can name it, so you can, you, can, you can reuse it. If I call that container PyTorch, and I can install a package, for instance, VM, VM Touch to load that assets in memory. And then if I reuse this container name and I add a mount, it's still the same container, and I will load my data set in memory. And then um, for interactive job, if I want um, a shell inside my container, it's actually, we don't do actually anything on this side. Slurm has a command, as a flag called dash dash PTY, and uh, I'm a fake, I mean, I'm remapped root inside the container, and I can do whatever I want with the combination of Slurm and our plugin. And we have uh, Slurm as batch jobs, so you can have a shell script, you just send this, uh, send this shell script to Slurm with sbatch, and you can run that on 64 nodes, for instance. And here it's something a bit more complicated, but uh, you can have a multi-node multi TensorFlow job uh, with 16 con um, process per node, and, 
and five minutes left. And we reached the conclusion, so we have five minutes for question. Um, so we'll have to, to thank all our colleagues because we've been working on that for a few months at NVIDIA. And uh, that's it. So our runtime and route is open source on GitHub, and our plugin is also open source, and we are open for questions now. So uh, could you explain a little bit better what didn't you find that you wanted in uh, current HPC container solutions that prompted you to create and root? So like, like Singularity, Shorty Cloud, these kind of things. Uh, well, we reviewed lots of them. And I mean, each one of them are their downsides. Uh, I mean, I, I, I could list like all the reasons for each one of them, but we evaluated all of them. Uh, the closest one was like Charlie Cloud, I think, which was the closest in philosophy as like Enroute. Problem is I was kind of a little too static in our taste, so we had we wanted something that was very more d dynamic and that like basically we could modify depending on cluster environments. So admins are wants to do some stuff in the container runtimes, and Charlie Cloud was kind of static. So uh, yeah, and they don't use all the tricks that we we have listed, so. I mean, eventually, maybe they will, but right now isn't the case. It was easier for us to write it. And again, there was 500 lines of bash, so it wasn't too complicated. Um, per perhaps I missed it. Uh, are there any bits that need root privileges in handling the containers? Uh, no. So the runtime itself is fully unprivileged. Uh, now, the import. You only have one, you need one cap to actually mount overlay, but then the, the actual squash is unprivileged. So by default, we don't allow users to pull images, uh, uh, to convert Docker images. I mean, even though they could do it with like Scopio and Umochi or something, we don't allow that. Uh, because basically, it's also discouraging like, people from pulling random stuff from the internet. And if the admin wants to uh, allow that, then you can just add one cap on, on the binary which is fairly safe because mounting read-only uh, overlay is fairly safe. Ubuntu allows it. Uh, other distribution don't, but uh, no, the rest is fully in privilege. Oh, that's going to be fun. Was it? So now, since all the focus here is on HPCs on performance, I would like to. Uh, can you put the mic ah, closer? Yeah. The, all the focus here is on performance on HPC side, side. And as a user, I would like to understand if your plan is more to go towards a substitute to the modules schema, where the where a single cluster provides you the modules for the software, and you load the module and run the, your software with the library already pre configured or you rather see the cluster the cluster uh, IT guys to provide you the container that is with the software specifically compiled for that cluster or you provide the container to run the software like tensorflow for example can I download the um, application from your side should pro should it be provided by my cluster IT guy or should I compile it myself in your environment how do you foresee it or the module schema is not it's not yet, it's not okay right now, for example. I mean, I see the module schema as the standard. Right, so the problem, the problem with modules and stuff, it's like, I mean, you don't get all the benefits from containers. So it's mostly admin driven, where our, in, our needs were more like user centric, where we want a user to bring their own applications. So modules didn't really fit uh, these. Uh, we didn't want admins to be really involved in, in the, the process of running apps. As for uh, actually compiling stuff specifically for your clusters, uh, we tend to do that with our containers. So, Okay, but yeah. if, if I am, um, how do you call it? If I am a developer and I develop my software, for, for example, in my specific case for TensorFlow, okay? I, I do that and at the end, if I provide to the end user the container with TensorFlow embedded in it, the flag that I will 
that I would have used to compile that uh, particular machine would have been the one that fit my own cluster's uh, environment, right. okay? Not the one of the final user in his own machine. Right. Okay? So it, it would be useless for him at the end, or it won't be the maximum performance that he will get by compiling it on its own machine. Right, and, and again, we, so we have a registry where we host all the optimized stuff for, um, for our platforms. Uh, but again, you, like, you can have an admin that just drops squash files that are specifically compiled for your clusters, and then your users can just use the squash file that the admin imported similarly to modules. Uh, or you can have the user, if he really knows what he's doing, can also push something to a registry and pull that. So we have both use cases covered pretty much. Uh, yeah. And we're out of time. Thank you.